Welcome to the Hunting Beast Podcast, your source for hunting tactics, news, and stories. And now your host, Mario Traficante. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Hunting Beast Podcast. This week, Dan and I will continue to answer questions from the Hunting Beast Forum. The actual area where the buck is bedding, or if you're setting up on that rise and it's bedding out in the more water area. Where, where I'm hunting? No, I think where the question this guy asked, that's what I was saying. Based on his description, like how he's setting up in more detail. Okay. Like, is he setting up on this 10 foot by 6 rise, which I'm I'm waiting in 18 to 24 inches of water to get in there, and the high spot is 10 by 6 or so. I would say the water is easily 5 acres, so he's on this little island. Oh, I thought he was hunting into water. Yeah, so... If he's on the island, he's going to have thermal problems. And then what you got to do is get to the edge, edge of it. So it's your water, you know, you're not pulling across it. But if it's that small, it shouldn't matter. By the time a deer gets in or your, your scent should be rising. Right. I mean, um, obviously use milkweed and see. I mean, he says twice the buck was in the bed and got me before I got in bow range. So maybe he's stalking in on this thing? I don't know. We need more information about this. Well, maybe he's thinking it's winding him before he gets in there. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty small island to try to get up on a buck. The bucks on the island? That's what I don't know for sure. Yeah. That's usually what they are out on those little hump islands. Right. You know? Right. That would make sense. Um, if, if, you, if you're spooking the deer, you need to hold back further. Yeah. I mean, they'll get a little ways, especially in that water. I mean, they gotta, they don't want to stand in water. There ain't food in there. They're going to move through it to that first landmass. Um, yeah. I mean, I would want to be as close as possible, but not so close I'm spooking them. So, I mean, that's the give and take. If you're not spooking a few deer, you're not getting close enough. But if you're spooking a few deer, you got to back off a little bit. Yeah. And if you spooked him twice, he's got your number. I mean, you, you're going to have to hold back a little further. Now, I would imagine you probably got limitation on tall trees in standing water, too. Yeah, well, if it's standing water, there probably ain't much vegetation. You climb up a tall tree, he's watching you. Right. So. Yeah. All right. Good question, though. Next one we got... For Dan, I'd like to hear more about in-season scouting, using hot sign, past buck encounters, and anything else you think of to pick which bedding area you are hunting that day. Well, I, I usually um, have a spot in mind, and I'm heading there, but if I'm not real confident in that spot, or, um, or even if I am, I'm scouting my way in. Um, most guys... When they go hunting, they go from point A to point B. They take that logging road for as far as they got to go, and then they cut off, and they take the same route they go through the woods every time. For me, I've got that inquisitive part of me that's like, I wonder what's going on over there. You know, why walk this same path when I can walk this one and check this whole transition? And on the way, you know, I know that anything coming out of this swamp right here, coming up out of the water and crap, they're not in there to take a bath. They're in their bedding. You know, they're, there's a reason they're in there. So if I find sign coming out of that swamp and it's big sign, and the next question is going to be, what's big sign? Well, big tracks, big rubs, fresh rubs, um, a fresh scrape there that maybe it's still got some urine in it or something or still stinks. You know, I'm thinking, well, you know what? There's probably somebody holed up in here. And uh, being a serial killer, I might want to hold up right there and kill him. So that's how I'm picking hot sign. Um, if I go into a place completely blind, um, I'm just going to do the same thing. I'm going to walk that transition until I find hot sign. And a lot of times I'll do that. Uh, I won't even take my bow with me or whatever. I'll just hit it, go walk some transitions and stuff, and check out some spots. Um, especially, like, like say I'm going to uh, on Iowa for a week or something. And then when I come back, it's going to be gun season and stuff, and my hunt's going to be over. i got two days. Well, there's 30 spots I want to hunt. You know? 
I'll go out and check them. You know, I only got two days anyway, so I'll go walk half of them, right? Whatever looked the best, I'm going back, getting my bowl, my stand, and going in there. You know, obviously now I'm not pushing them out of their beds. I'm not pushing it as close. And the thing about hot sign and hunting it is you're going to get misled a lot. There's going to be the, the um, tendency to hunt too far back because you don't know exactly where that bed is unless you've pre-scouted it and you're looking for hot sign, which is the case sometimes. But if you're going in completely blind, you got to kind of guess. And that's where, if you look at enough bedding, you start getting an eye for that. Like, um, I think uh, you've probably seen that with us. When we go out in the swamp, I'll push further than you probably would. And not that Mario will say anything, but he'll give me that look and I know what he's thinking. <laughs> you know, but I'll push further than most people because I've got that eye for it because I've looked at so much bedding, I know where they're at. Or I'll say, no, we got to stop right here. This is, this is where we got to stop. And the thing about hot bedding too is, is, you know, and I read this recently on the forum, I think today even, uh, somebody was uh, asking about scout with the stand on their back and they're like, well, you, you know, you got to be pretty quiet cutting limbs, eh? Well, you probably shouldn't be cutting limbs. Yeah. I'm kind of picking my spot based on my shooting and I'm not walking over, looking at the tree, looking around. I'm going in slow and stealthy. I'm keeping an eye on where I think the bedding is and I'm looking for the tree that's got the lanes already there and I don't need much. I'm a patient guy. I wait for the shot. But I do need to not walk where that deer is going to be. Yeah. Or a different deer coming out. And I need to be able to shoot to that spot before he smells me. That's important. Yeah. Not wandering around. So when you walk in a transition, here's a temptation too. Walk in the transition of a swamp. You know, you're on a ridge of oaks. Mm -hmm. And you're out in the middle of nowhere and you're say big woods or something where people don't get and these deer are going to come out of that swamp feeding them oaks. That's a common scenario all of us have dealt with. You walk in that edge, the temptation is to walk right on the absolute edge of that transition because you can see the muddy tracks. That's usually where rubs are where they're coming out of the thick and they stop and they rub all their weight and stuff. You see the sign a little better. Try getting an arrow in that crap. Yeah. You know, you got to you got to stay back far enough and kind of look in. You know, be patient that you, you know, use your eyes because you got to be able to shoot to them when they come. If you walk across that trail, now try going in that swamp and setting up without spooking that deer if he's bedded 40 yards in or something. And when you do set up, if you haven't been there before, he might be 40 yards in there. He might be 4,000 yards over and it's going to be midnight when he gets there. You're taking a chance. It's a little bit of a risk. But you're looking at it and you're saying, yeah, I think he might be bedded here and the sign's here. Don't walk that right on that, that line because you won't be able to shoot to that. Or that deer will smell you before you have a shot. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys picked up on this, but as Dan talks, um, he always sort of subconsciously relates everything back to bedding. So when you guys ask about going in on foot and recognizing hot sign, whether it be, you know, big tracks, a community scrape, um, a rub or a licking branch or some sort of sign that a deer has been there recently. Maybe the tree has got sap pouring out of it and a buck has just been there active on it. Um, you know, deer poop, any, you know, there's browse. You you see browse in an area where you normally don't see it. Um, converging trails, all these things. I think what I've noticed is when you see that stuff, think about well, when when was this sign made? Was it was it done last night? Was it done an hour ago? Um, even if this is a spot I don't know, but I typically have a map of it. Maybe I looked at it online or printed a map out. Where do I still think it is in proximity to bedding? And that'll help you out, saying you know what. When I looked at this online, I thought bedding was here, and now I see this hot sign, and I'm. 200 yards away, or I'm 150 yards away. So this is, timing-wise, I think this is a pretty good set. I'm going to get up the tree and try it. And honestly, worst case scenario, you know, you don't push far enough. You don't see the deer. You've got another hunt. You can stage hunt it back in further the next time you go out. Or, you know, you push too far, and we've done this, and bump the deer. <laughs> and... 
then you know, okay, now I know there's a bed there because I bumped the deer out of it. Um, so, and that's where if you can do preseason scouting, like, like Dan said, and identify a bed, identify those, those transition trails and all that proximity, then you can start putting the pieces together. But, um, that's know, a, that's a good point because you know, the whole hunting industry, uh, everybody from magazines to TV shows and everything is cramming on your throat that, um, uh, uh, you should be looking for sign as in that's what you're looking for a sign or food. Right. And really, you know, you got to look for where they're moving in daylight and everything. And I mean, everything you do revolves around bedding. And some people are going to say, well, not everything, Dan, but no, everything, even rut. You watch people, um, and how they talk about rut. And the novice guy who's the magazine TV type guy is going to say, well, you need funnels, you need tight spots, you need this. When they're cruising, you need tight spots. What good is a tight spot if it leads to a cornfield? And that's it. And bedding's over here. It's not. If they're moving in rut in daylight and they're moving through a tight spot, they're moving between bedding areas. Whether it's yeah. doe bedding areas or buck bedding areas, everything in daylight movement revolves around bedding. You either got to be close enough to the bedding to kill it, or you got to be in between two bedding areas when a buck's worked up enough to go looking for does. Um, and those big bucks don't do that as often as people think. That's why most of the time when you're rut hunting, you're seeing the, the two-year-olds, the one-year-olds, and the occasional three-year-old. You know, I don't, I don't see too many five, six, seven-year-old bucks um, cruising through funnels. And even when you're in areas where they live, and there's a lot of them, even when I've hunted managed cushy land, like say with Andre or something, you still don't see that target buck, the one you're targeting, going through those funnels like that very often. They do it, or they wouldn't get killed. They do it occasionally. But it's not something they make a habit of. I mean, they got to get pretty worked up. you got to hit the right day at the right time and not have been in there previously when he's gone through there at night. You know, I, I targeted a huge buck down by Andre's um, that was a big eight-pointer. Right. On this managed land where hardly anybody hunts. Get that thing to move during daylight. You know, and I saw plenty of big bucks moving in daylight going through these funnels. But in reality, those big rack bucks were three-year-olds. And they probably wouldn't have been doing that in public. But there, because of no pressure, they were able to make those mistakes and still grow up. But that big buck... I had to narrow that whole property down until I got to the ridge he was living on, even in peak rut, and he was with a doe, he wouldn't come off of that ridge. And I, I literally shot him 50, 75 yards away from where him and the doe were bedding. And they stayed in that thick cover. There was a hole cut into the cover that I shot him on. Right. And it's not that they're running around wild and crazy during a rut. Sure, they make mistakes, but if you want to consistently get older class bucks, you got to push that envelope. You got to seek out the bed and you got to seek out those spots where they'll move in daylight. And usually that's close to bedding or the bedding areas. If they're circling, they're, they're seeking out a doe bedding area. And, and you've seen this with me yeah. where I've said that buck's going to be holed up right on that bedding area because he's not going to move around in daylight. And that wasn't an area that gets pounded hunting. Right. And where was he? Pretty much right where we thought he'd be. Yeah. And after season, and I always do this, it's a good tip. I go and confirm when, when we see a big buck. We go back and we scout. Okay, I seen one here. Even if we thought we knew what was going on, let's find out exactly what was going on. And we went and checked out and found that rut bed and found where he was sitting. I don't think he was 100 yards, maybe 70 yards yeah, from, from the bed. 170, 100 yards. Yeah. But the way the wind was blowing across that island, when that hot doe came up on the island, it would have been the perfect scent stream trail for him to scent check whatever came up on that island. And I think, you know, maybe if you guys can see this. We'll draw a little picture over here. I you know those you of you are sketching these deer. What's wrong with you? <laughs> with deer on your head. Dan brings up an interesting point about the bedding and how mature bucks travel through a property versus how immature bucks. We've all seen a lot of immature bucks year and a half, two year olds, you know, two and a half year olds that'll just run wild across the top of islands or they'll be chasing doe. You'll see them active, but those mature bucks, like if you've got 
if you've got islands that are that are set up, let's say in in proximity here, and maybe you've got you know a creek or you've got a, a pond of water here, you've got other land obstacles. I think what you got to think about is, let's say there's out here, you know, into this spot way over here, you you think that this is the the buck bedding per se, right? But you know that you've got doe bedding here, you know, you've got doe bedding here, you've got you know, some doe bedding here. So then what I've seen, you know, Dan think about in some of this stuff is that how is that buck most efficiently travel through that whole property so he can check the, all these bedding areas at once. Mm -hmm. You know, you might see an immature buck, he'll come in and he'll run. You know, he may run all over these these islands, right? Broad daylight. Where Depending on how the wind flows across, let's say, you know, you've got wind blowing across in this direction, you know, it's coming off the top there. So all this scent's going to be blown across. Well, if a buck wants to come and check that, how is he going to travel through here? You know, he's going to sneak through this in some way that's going to be most mm -hmm. efficient where he can catch scent here. Maybe he's got a path where he can wrap around here come through and check the, you know, the scent off this, where he can hit all three of those doe bedding areas to see if there's any hot doe. Yeah, what, what we typically see on these uh, these swamps like this that have islands in them, is you'll see the hunters hunting where two connect or something, they'll be right up in the middle here or someplace, and where I'm gonna end up is into thick swamp funnels, you know? In these areas, maybe even over here, and I'm going to hop around that, and I'm going to hunt the, these spots like that. And I guarantee you, I'm not going to see the number of deer that these guys see. I'm not. But I'm going to see bigger stuff. Right. And, I mean, I've proved that time and a time, time again. I mean, we've hunted with people in the same swamps where they're coming back telling us, oh, we seen, I seen 10 bucks. Well, I didn't see 10 bucks. Right. How big was your biggest buck? Well, an eight-pointer. Yeah. You know, and I only seen two bucks, but they're both like this, you know. One was only an eight pointer, <laughs> but <laughs> you know. Well, and it's a, it can be a tricky thing because sometimes that mature buck, he may bed, he may have some really good bedding right off the tip mm -hmm. of an island like that. And maybe there's a crest on yeah. this island and that scent is rolling off there and he knows that once he you know, smells something hot up here, boom, he's on that island and he's giving chase. Or he's wrapping around, you know, and he's giving chase in the transition. Yeah. He doesn't even come up on the island. He gives chase in the there's, transition. There's a good point you're making there, too. That's something I missed when, when I was talking about my setups, or I just didn't get to, let's say. But uh, when, when you uh, look at this and how you go in here and set up, I'm not just necessarily setting up in these spots. Those are kill spots. Normally, I'm going in and I'm hunting a spot like right here. I'm hanging in the, uh, in the swamp. Or I'm hunting like right here because I'm looking into the swamp and I'm monitoring what the bucks are doing and then I'm moving in for the kill. Does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll be sitting here, you know, and there's, there'll be a trail there. I mean, there'll be a trail that goes by me or when it comes through like this. So I'm not sitting in a dead spot. Right. But I don't necessarily think I'm absolutely in a kill spot either. And I'll, maybe I'll see that buck take that path Mario was talking about, right? And then I'm planning from the tree to get into here. And the swamps we're, we're talking about in this scenario, I mean, it's probably not what everybody's hunting, but if this is dogwood and cattails and stuff, I'm, per, I'm specifically picking a tree where I'm high up and there's openings where I can see. And a lot of my hunts are observations. And a few of my hunts are kill hunts. Yeah. And it just so happens that those kill hunts usually pay off yeah. because of the observation hunts. But an observation hunt where I could actually kill something. I mean, you're not wasting your time or anything. Right. Um, but, uh, I mean, in the, you know, if you guys, you know, this is swamp. If you want to talk hill country, I mean, I hunted a property for many years that was hill country. And I basically was hunting it wrong for many years, you know. I mean, it was a smaller property and... After learning 
you know, there was a main ridge line that transitioned, you know, through the entire property. Spilled out onto a field that kind of wrapped around, you know, like this. But what I ended up realizing is that on this transition line, there was one core spot that had bedding, dough bedding, right here. And what was interesting during the rut is that you'd get a predominant wind out of the southwest here, and there was a you know another valley that was kind of like there's another valley that was right here. And these bucks would get on this transition and they would run this thing here and that they would come up out of bedding out of the neighbor's property here. And one day like clockwork, I sat off. I think I was sitting over on this side. And I observed, I watched these bucks chase these doe up, tend to them up here, chase them back off, chase them up, chase them back off, chase them up. And the whole day they focused on corralling these animals here. And the next day I actually set my buddy up, you know, we didn't go into this area. We hadn't walked in this area yet. I was just there to actually set him up, you know, right in here with his climber. And he shot over the back of two bucks. <laughs> but the thing was, is that, like, that was the pattern. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there likely was a wind tunnel effect going on here. Um, you know, these bucks were being pulled in off property on this side, and they could walk that ridge line and smell any dough up there. Any dough that they pushed out of bedding here, they could get them up on this ridge, and it was really thick up on top of that ridge. Mm -hmm. And it was like the one spot in the property that was thick and protected, you know. Um, so it kind of goes back to that point of understanding how the mature animal would use the property. Not just seeing deer, but, yeah. but how they use it. You've got to look at mature animals like they're a whole separate animal. Yeah. There's so many people that think they get in a good spot if they're seeing deer during the game, but those little deer are stringing them along. I mean, they gotta right. you you gotta concentrate on uh, on the big animals. I mean, it's like and it, I mean, it sounds kind of weird, but it's like you're you're hunting squirrels and rabbits. You don't hunt squirrels like you hunt rabbits. Yeah, and big bucks are not like regular deer. Uh, they when they're mature, they go about things different. And you got to hunt for mature bucks. Yeah. It definitely it can make it interesting and fun when you start mm -hmm. thinking about that and trying it, to figure it you out. You know what makes a guy a good hunter is when he when he can start setting aside and not hunting deer. Because there's that temptation. I know if I go to that stand, I'll kill a deer. Yeah. You know, for a young guy who wants to kill a deer. But when you can say, you know what, that's not what I want. That's not what I'm at. I'm not here to hunt squirrels. Right. Right. So you go after what you're after, and you'll get it. But if 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 you set your goal as I really want to kill a big buck, but I certainly want to kill a buck, and I'm not passing on 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 any bucks that got more than eight points. Well, you're not going to kill a big buck that way. You're going to kill a big buck by hunting big bucks. You don't kill big bucks by hunting elk, and you don't hunt you kill them by hunting squirrels. They're a species of their own. You have to seek that out, and that's what you have to go after. Yeah. Or you're not going to kill them because you're going to be wasting your time. You know, you hear these guys like, you know, um, I take a couple days out the season and I just doe hunt. Man, I ain't wasting a day. I'm buck hunting. That's what I'm hunting. I'm hunting that buck. You know, I'll kill a doe. End of the day, one's coming through. You're going to get opportunities. You can kill one, recock, and wait, too, in a lot of cases. They don't know what happened. Yeah. You know, and the good thing is I'm not going back to that spot tomorrow. Because I know that once I'm in there, I burn that bridge. So, you know, I'll kill a doe when it's convenient and I'm not going to spook something when I'm on a regular hunt. But I'm not taking one of my, say I only get 35, 40 hunts in a year, I'm not taking one of those hunts and wasting it. Yeah. Because I might need 35 or 40 hunts to kill that big buck. I'm hunting a big buck till I get a big buck. I'm not wasting my time hunting does and I'm not going over to the spot that's got all the action. I mean, you got to decide, are you a deer hunter 
or are you looking for a trophy buck? Because if you're looking for a trophy buck, get your focus, focus your glasses. What are you aiming for? Yeah. Well, and I think too, it's if you're starting to hunt this style and you're trying out different sets and different things that you looked at during scouting and looked at different bedding, um, don't rate your success by the number of deer that you see during an, any one given sit. Um, I've gone several sits, several sits in a row, not seeing a single deer, you know, walk all the way back there, get all sweated up, get all, go through all this craziness and don't see anything. But it was a beautiful day out in, out in the swamp and out in nature. But, you know, you have to be okay with that, that you might get back to the truck and talk to your buddy and he might have saw 20 deer because he was sitting on a field edge. But, you know, it's, it's a different, you're, you're after a different thing if you're looking for that mature buck bed. When you see a deer, you're probably only going to see that deer. Right. You know, I can, remember, I can remember a season when I hunted 30 days in a row without seeing a deer, a single deer. Yeah. And I think most people will just crawl up in a ball and suck their thumb. But I keep the mindset that the next hunt is, is the one that matters. You know, and I ended up, the first deer I saw was a nice 10 pointer and I shot it. But it took 30 hunts, 30 sets of seeing nothing to get them. Yeah. Now I could have easily just said, screw this, I'm going over by that cornfield there, there's deer there every night. But, you, you know, it brings me to another, another uh, story here. Okay, when I used to guide, and uh, I had clients over every weekend, and the neighbor was a big hunter. Yeah. Um, He'd been hunting out there for, I don't know, 20 years or something. Um, and he would hunt right behind my house. He'd hunt all over the place in the swamp. And uh, I had these clients from out of state uh, who were after big bucks. And uh, I was taking them out hunting. And I put one of them on this little bedding area right next to my house, right behind my house. And uh, now the DNR dug out a hole and made it into a pond, thank them, you know. Ducks. Yeah, let's make duck habitat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I got a duck Sorry to all the duck on. hunters. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anywho, I put this guy in this, this bedding area there, and he shot a 150-inch 11-pointer, uh, you know. So, anywho, we dragged this thing back out. You know, we get it in the truck. And the other guys that were hunting with him, they seen some nice bucks, you know, so we're doing pretty good, you know. So we got this buck in the back of the truck and we're shooting the crap and the neighbor's coming over and, you know, these guys are smart enough not to say too much, you know. But the neighbor comes over and goes, holy crap, is that a huge buck? You know, that's nice, you know, I, never, I haven't seen one like that in years and blah, blah, blah. And he's going on and on and on and he's looking at this buck and, um, you know, it's getting later and later and I say, hey, I, you know, I'm sorry, but I got to get these guys out and on the woods, you know, and they need to get out hunting, you know, they paid for this or whatever, and, and he goes, oh, oh, okay, I understand, he goes, where are you guys going, I go, oh, I ain't got much time, I'm probably just going to take them all back, and he looks at me, and he goes, I wouldn't take them on that swamp, I've been hunting that for 20 years, there ain't a buck like that in that whole swamp, he says, and those guys are looking at each other, like, what the hell, <laughs> <laughs> right, that's just where we got that one from, right, <laughs> you know, but that's the, this guy had been hunting out there for 20 years, and had never seen a buck like that, but yet every weekend I was putting clients on bucks like that and they're killing them. Yeah. And he thinks I'm taking them to some private farm or something. Right. You know, but he could hunt that for 20 years and never see one. Why am I seeing them? Why are my clients seeing them? Why are they killing them? Well, simply because that's what we're hunting. This guy was hunting deer. He was sitting in the oaks waiting for one to come in to get acorns. He's sitting by the cornfields. He's sitting in the funnels. Yeah. Hunting like it's rut all year. Yeah. Yeah. No, good point. All right, we're only on question seven out of uh, 42, so we better... We're not getting done with them all. We better we have to we, do another one of these. We better go start cracking here. Um, so this next one, Dan and Mario also run hunting in swamps and marshes. I think we kind of covered that with our last little yeah. diagram for the most part. Um Another one, 
Dan and Mario, hunting small properties, how to time out your kill attempt in the, those overlooked spots. Okay. Um, if it's a smaller property. So let's say a guy's got a 20 acre property and he's got a good bed in there. He's got one real spot in there, right? Mm -hmm. One or two. Um, the big thing about timing on those small properties or any property for that matter, because to me, I think small property is kind of cliche. They're all small properties because every little bed and area I hunt is a small little spot. Yeah. Whether it's on a 4,000 acre piece or it's on a 20 acre piece, it's a hunting spot. And you got to look at it like that. You got to look at it like this one or two hunts, maybe three in a year. You, if you did an early season, a rut, a late season, if you're hunting it more than that, it's going to get bad. And I think that's kind of what he's pro polluting to is that, you know, when do I go in? You know, well, there's going to be some repetition there. If you had an uh, encounter there in September, expect to have another one the next September, yeah. around the same date. They're repetitive. Food changes pretty much to the date. Right. And bedding and cover changes pretty much to the date. It's not exact, but the same time frame. And I would expect those bucks to be in there the same time every year. And if you don't know when that time is and you're trying to figure that out, you know, I'm going to give you the cliche answers that he already knows, and that's glass, that's going to be watch, that's going to be, you know, observe, it's going to be check the food sources off to the side. But when that all fails, or hopefully it doesn't, but when it does, or if it does, you got to go in there and bust a hunt. And if you don't know, you can't figure it out, and those things aren't working for you, you got to go in there in September and hunt it. Or if you start in October, which a lot of guys do, go in there in early October and hunt it. Yeah. If that don't work, go in there at the end towards rut and hunt it. If that don't work, go in there in December and hunt it. And even if you don't see a deer on all three of those sets in that particular spot, what you should see is if the sign is there, if it's hot, if it's not, and you should start to get a feel for when the, the buck's there. Um... Maybe it takes a couple seasons, but this guy, in my opinion, when he says, I got this small spot, when do I go in there, is it sounds like he's putting too many eggs in that basket. That's a hunting spot. You know, a lot of guys think because they got a private acre and it's 20 acres, and I'm not saying this is you, but a lot of guys are thinking they got this 20, 30 acre spot and it's private. They're the only one that's going in there that they got a kind of golden spot. Now they just got to figure out when and stuff like that. Well... It doesn't matter if it's private. It doesn't matter if it's public. Deer can't read no trespassing signs, and they can't read uh, private property signs, and they don't know if it's public or private. They know it's a bedding spot. So if they got this little spot to bed, it's no different than the spots I'm on. That concludes today's podcast episode. Please go to thehuntingbeast.com to post any discussions, questions, or comments regarding today's podcast episode.